And joining us now with more insight into yesterday's attack is senior national security analyst Juan Zarate. Juan, thanks for being with us. My Investigators pleasure. have not yet found a connection between the gunman and any terror groups, but how likely do you think it is that he was inspired perhaps by ISIS to carry out a lone wolf attack? Well, Lane, we don't know enough yet to make that determination, but it is likely, given the environment, given the attempts by the Islamic State, remnants of al-Qaeda to inspire and radicalize individuals to attack in their home countries, that we're going to find some sort of link, uh, some indication uh, that the individual had been radicalized, perhaps not directly uh, deployed by a foreign terrorist organization, but uh, perhaps inspired by the messaging. And certainly, uh, fall, you know, potentially falling prey to the narrative of attacking fellow citizens and especially military personnel uh, in the United States. And so, unfortunately, it may be a case of radicalization and the deployment of uh, an individual in our country. Juan, we've talked about this in the past, uh, sadly, all too often. Uh, but part of the message from the president to European leaders is that a lot of these attacks, a lot of these young men that commit these attacks are motivated primarily because they do not have economic opportunities open to them. But by all accounts, this man, this young man, Abdulaziz, was a typical all-American, as he's described by his neighbors in his community. Uh, he grew up in the, he grew up in Chattanooga. He went to Chattanooga State. He got an engineering degree. He was into martial arts. These are the, he played wiffle ball. One neighbor saying, uh, so does that sort of turn that theory up on its head? Vlad, it's a great question because I think the false assumption is that. Uh, there's a cookie cutter profile to each and every radicalized individual and terrorist and that the motivation is lack of opportunity, uh, lack of economic uh, uh, upward mobility. Uh, you've heard the president speak often and recently about lack of jobs, et cetera, as a, as a motivating factor. Um, the reality is each case is different, um, but the reality too with Al Qaeda and the Islamic State is that from the West they've tended to attract uh, more upwardly mobile, middle-class, well-educated, well-resourced individuals. And in fact, Vlad, if you look at the core of al-Qaeda itself, that's made up of very well-funded, well-educated individuals, in including uh, some of the forefathers of al-Qaeda and, and the founding fathers of that group who were electrical engineers, who had graduate degrees, uh, and all of whom had opportunities. And so you're absolutely right that we've got to be careful about the assumptions we make about radicalization and look to the reality that this is an ideology and a narrative that in many ways is inspiring individuals because it gives them a sense of purpose, meaning, and sometimes identity, even if they are well-resourced, have good jobs, and appear adjusted in their environments. Juan, how can U.S. officials protect against individuals if they self-radicalize and don't leave any kind of digital trail or evidence? Elaine, you've heard this from counterterrorism officials now for years. This is the hard problem, uh, in some ways the nightmare scenario, where you have individuals who are self-radicalized, perhaps imbibing information from the Internet, perhaps engaged in uh, closet social media interactions that indicate some radicalization, but without a direct connection to a foreign terrorist organization or known uh, terrorists who are being uh, followed by the FBI or other intelligence agencies. And so... This really is the difficult problem. Uh, an individual who's not on the radar screen, uh, there's no reason to su suspect that uh, he's going to attack uh, and suddenly decides uh, because he's motivated for some distorted purpose to, to attack. And, um, you know, unfortunately, this really is the hard problem and there isn't an easy solution. Juan, before we let you go quickly, this may be a political question, but is it time to perhaps start looking at ways from an intelligence perspective to prohibit certain sites, certain of the propaganda sites that are being uh, put out there by ISIS, by al-Qaeda, uh, to have access for those sites in the United States? Is that something, just like in the same way at work, we can't access certain sites that in the U.S. you wouldn't be able to access certain sites that are being, uh, pro that are being used as propaganda by terrorist organizations? But I don't think you're going to see much appetite, given the First Amendment, given the nature of our society and freedoms, to restrict access to information. But there is an ongoing debate, and you ask a very important question as to how you deal with the messaging of groups like the Islamic State and al-Qaeda that is intended to foment this kind of violence and to radicalize and mobilize individuals to attack in place. 
That is an ongoing debate about how you counter the, these messages, uh, whether or not you can take down sites, how effective that really is when they can re-up those sites very easily and when they can switch Twitter accounts uh, at the change of, a, of an account or a name. And so this is a really important debate. It's not new, but I doubt that this is going to lead to uh, restrictions on the Internet. All right, Juan Zarate, thank you so much, Juan. We appreciate it. My pleasure.